So let me ask a, a question of uh, uh, the panel here. I guess we're talking about um, buying versus building and about how to, um, I guess Mike brought up the point that we should back fewer horses uh, and make them, maybe make them more general um, and applicable in more areas rather than uh, each go off on our own separate way. How do we get together in, um, besides conferences like this uh, to merge together the requirements of different sciences, of industry, uh, so that we can coalesce on a few key products. But you, you, guys, you guys should just pay attention to the commercial business market completely standardized on SQL a million years ago. And they would only back SQL guys. And there were a few vendors that won and a very powerful, very standardized market. And the only thing you have to do is accept that good enough is better than build your own. So, all right, so I was saying that the astronomy is trying to do it. So um, they switched to SQL a decade ago and we are trying to stay with SQL in LSST. Although there are some really complex analysis like comparing time series, which we really have hard time wrapping our heads around through SQL. So you need an array database. <laughs> Possibly, yeah, but you still time, don't support. Time is just another dimension in an array system. I mean, Once I you start supporting spherical geometry, we will definitely think about it. OK, I think I, I guess we are the bad guys, because we did not even realistically try to, do, to use SQL. And this is simply because our data model and the uh, uh, which is a tree model doesn't uh, produce a good match on SQL. Yes, you can you can try to put trees into SQL, but but it gets very very inefficient. And for people who are used uh, to program against objects pointing to each other in memory, it just gets very hard to accept that for each of the 100 classes they have to write specialized code, which which does the job of mapping this into SQL. We have really tried a lot of different ways of approaching this, including object relational and all this stuff, which you, I guess, would also not suggest because that's not an open source product. Um, so I think for some data models, I know it's very easy to say science should do the same thing, but I think at some point you have to accept that sciences are very different. There are some sciences which have a clear mapping, a more clear mapping to arrays because they have a problem which is in two-dimensional space uh, because they have data structures which are pictures and so on. For HEP, uh, that's definitely not true. I think our data does not have a trivial mapping to, we use arrays, but it's not all, everything is an array. And without the, uh, the <coughs> language support to express the complexity of the data, we, we don't get very far. In addition, we are not only selecting, we are processing a lot. There's a lot of crowd out there who, wants to do processing and the selection rather in the same language. I know there's a lot of reasons not <coughs> to do that, yeah. but it, it has been proven to be very hard to, to, uh, to go on the SQL level with our data. Also, one of the interesting things you said in your talk uh, was that your users rejected SQL at the schema definition stage. Well, and that was ob uh, this was SQL with object extensions. I think during the period when we gave up on object databases, the next step was basically, uh, can we use a relational database with, which has an automatic mapping uh, between C++ as a language and SQL? I mean, Oracle at some point had uh, a product uh, where just coming out with OCCI, which was a C++ interface, but uh, what it did imply was that you define your data model first in SQL, and then you get a generated header file which, uh, which has a lot of intrusive oracle types instead of the, the, the attributes that you would, wanted to put. I mean, you know, you want an int, you get a number, or OCCI number, some, something. And that was simply a no-go for a large long-term project to have a very intrusive way of providing this automatic mapping to, uh, to SQL into all of our source code, and therefore it was rejected. But I think you guys are being very schizophrenic, because uh, 
The minute Yasek decides to go with MySQL, he's going to pay an order of magnitude penalty relative to something that better suits his needs. So you're, <clears throat> when you start saying, I rejected A or B or C because, for performance reasons, which is what you're, you're just saying, uh, then uh, yeah, you, 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 should, you should beat up Yasek for taking an order of magnitude penalty hit <laughs> Uh, just by his choice of database system. And, and you know, like Facebook has the biggest graph on the planet stored in MySQL. And they're simply willing to take a performance hit to get commercial quality, robust software that they don't have to maintain. And you guys are all buying the farm in terms of downstream maintenance. And I've heard this argument endlessly. And what it means is that every big science project builds its own stack pretty much from the ground up. And well, you just can't afford to do it. Right. That's exactly what we're having this conference. And that's exactly what we're having this discussion here. Because too many projects are uh, rebuilding. So that's why we killed you know, half a day discussing this, right? <laughs> <laughs> and we are still doing it. So uh, to date, we haven't seen any off-the-shelf projects which would answer the kinds of queries that we need to deal with. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we are not using off-the-shelf. However, we are not really, we don't like the way we are going. So if we would find the off-the-shelf, we would definitely very happily use it. I mean, I had it in the very last slide, the very last bullet. So I'm not saying that, you know, 10 years from now, we will be definitely using MySQL plus extra D plus our system. We don't like to maintain it for 20 years. We understand the complexity and the costs. And that's why we are trying to steer the community towards something that would be working towards LSST. And we did a good progress with, uh, even through the first XLDB. I think one of the problems is that you went more towards images. So the database doesn't map that nicely into, um, into CIDB. The images map much it works, better. It works, it works perfectly on spherical coordinates. The LIRA guys are doing exactly that. CIDB? I mean, yeah, user it would, today user with the, user with the user wraparound and the user-defined types work like a charm. The, the database Paul. systems do user-defined types. So let's ask anyway, Paul. Well, well, can well, but this, before this we get is too far, a rat. Just maybe. this. Uh, did you have a comment, Ravi? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> since uh, Facebook yeah. was came up. Yeah. Since Facebook came up, um, and again, I'm not too familiar with exactly the, the requirements of this project. But at Facebook, I mean, the, the way we look at it is, yes, MySQL sharded was great for the social graph. But then um, recently we had this blog post where we talked about there are certain access patterns that MySQL wasn't really good at. Um, so we built this sort of caching layer called Tau, um, which is a much more graph-centric way of caching objects, which uh, solves those use cases in terms of performance and efficiency. Uh, but then we, have, we didn't have to rebuild everything just to get that. So I think that's sort of at least our lesson learned there. OK. But, but so, well, one quick thing. Okay. Is, is it true that Facebook uh, deploys, for example, MySQL on a very large cluster, and they get around the performance issues. Yes, that, and yeah. there is a talk coming up tomorrow so, that will yeah. exactly go into the details so of that. So that's the kind of luxury we don't have. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay, so I think, Paul, you get like 10 seconds, and then I want to kind of move on to a slightly different topic. Or... Very good. Um, I'll just I'll throw, throw three rocks out there and see what they hit. So the first one is that in 1996, I visited 3M. And I was a you know, exponent of data, relational database engines at that point. And I had exactly this conversation about tree-based structures with uh, 3M bill of materials problems. And the fundamental challenge that 3M has is that they build these large, complicated uh, pieces of engineering. And they're all tree-structured. And you want to be able to move parts around in them and so forth. The initial reaction was, look, you know, we can't use a relational engine for this because it just doesn't work. It doesn't scale for all the reasons you referred to. So Joe Chelko turned up, and uh, he took a SQL Server system, and he did a very simple thing, and he replaced the entire 3M Bill of Materials manufacturing organizational system with a single uh, SQL Server image, and it ran about two orders of magnitude faster than the old system that they had, which was built around objectivity. The problem that we have often is that we tend to think about data models as being fixed. Conceptual level, yes, they're fixed, but the logical level, you've got considerable flexibility. Um, I guarantee that there's not a single bill of materials or a hierarchical problem that I can't handle very efficiently inside a relational system using either Chelco's DFS notation 
uh, or a thing called the Dewey node system, which is now shipped in, in DB2 and in Formix, point one. Um, point two, spherical geometry. Uh, our experience in PsyDB with spherical geometry, uh, both with the LIRA system that Mike mentioned and also a, a, another group in Europe, is that what they're finding is the most efficient way to handle it, even in a SQL system, is to convert the two uh, at right ascension declination or uh, uh, lat long uh, into an XYZ, a 3D coordinate space, and then index on that. Uh, that seems to give you better performance than any of the other sort of geodetic information systems that um, are better performance and scalability. Um, I'd just like to bring those, at least those two rocks up. Okay. Um, I want to ask, uh, okay, we'll get to in one second. I just want to ask a question. Um, earlier today we heard about, uh, you know, from uh, Greg, I think it was, um, about assembling different APIs and components into uh, an overall system to do something. And can we, instead of uh, rebuilding from the ground up or buying a complete system off the shelf, um, manage to rework the ecosystem into a, a set of components that can solve the difficult problems already uh, and that we can just assemble rather than having to completely customize or completely recode? Uh, it looks like the Hadoop ecosystem is kind of evolving in this fashion. You can bring in you know, your machine learning here, you can bring in your, your fast queries here, your advanced uh, your query languages on top. Um, is there something similar that, that we should be striving for instead of you know, a few do everything products? Yeah, I think at Facebook we had a very good sort of experience over the last few years in terms of this variety of use cases. And initially we had a bunch of attempts to try and keep extending a single system to be able to handle all the use cases. And at some point we realized that that just was giving this bad experience to everyone. Um, so now we are increasingly looking at sort of specialized stacks for different use cases, but then doing it in a very, uh, in a manner that tries to reuse as much as possible. So like the HDFS, the, the basic storage layer is something that seems to work pretty well as the uh, the data, uh, the, the, the place from where you draw the data for your computation. But then graph processing infrastructure looks very different from the approximate query answering system which is very different from a, a real-time stream processing system. So we're increasingly sort of decoupling storage and compute engines in a way that uh, there's much more mix and match. I think the 95% the, uh, of the Facebook queries to their data warehouse are expressed in Hive. So in fact, there is a standard, it's called Hive. And in fact, there's a huge commercial infrastructure that is gutting the everything below the hive layer because it doesn't work worth a crap. And so people are getting rid of the map, map reduce layer, people are getting rid of the HDFS layer, there's a huge amount of innovation and that works perfectly as long as you push the user up to the hive level. The minute you start assembling tinker toys, you're not gonna get, you're not gonna get the advantage of the commercial market moving forward without you having to recode everything. So I'm a huge fan of high-level languages. Uh, I'm not, not opposed to inventing a couple more. But yeah, let's, <laughs> not, let's not have tinker toys. You know, push, push people. You know, Cod's idea from 1970 was push, push the users far away from their data, and then you can change all the innards without it impacting them. Yeah, I think we've definitely seen that having that declarative language made both the analysts and the engineers a lot more productive in being able to express their computation. There's a lot of reuse where uh, you know, the user-defined function libraries sort of got built and then uh, it matured to the point where every new engineer didn't have to rebuild the same uh, functionality. Um, and then it gives us the opportunity to go back and keep changing the internals of the system without uh, disrupting all the workflows. Having said that, we've also encountered places where a language is just reaching the limits of what it can express, and we have to invent either new languages or new APIs to enable those sorts of use cases. But again, starting with a notion of a standard API really helps. Yeah, I was actually going to ask, ask a very sim similar question, which is, you know, how do we avoid you know, everyone going away and building their own thing? And, and the obvious answer seems to be, let's standardize on architectures particularly in these, these projects which last 10 years or more, you know, it's, if, if one thing is certain, there's gonna be better technology around in 10 years time than there is now. So we, we need to be architecting on the assumption that something better is gonna, gonna appear. Um, 
So what are those architectural components? And I, uh, I don't know, I disagree with Mike's assertion, here I go, um, that uh, HDFS is disappearing. I mean, people are building better implementations of HDFS and maybe they're improving you know, some of the primitives in HDFS, but people like Yahoo and I guess Facebook as well are using HDFS to build not just batch mode systems, but real-time systems and uh, you know, machine learning systems. And it's, it's proving to be a pretty, pretty good, stable architectural component. Um, so my question, it's a kind of, to be devil's, devil's advocate, why, uh, why isn't the scientific community, uh, you know, building its own equivalent, or why, isn't they, why aren't they using HDFS or something similar to it as a kind of substrate? Um, of course, you can have the high-level language on top of that, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, there's an awful lot of work to be done below that high-level language. Uh, the, to be to be thrown away and rebuilt every few years, every time we have a better idea. So, because um, the simple answer is HDFS is a distributed file system. Every serious query engine wants to send the query to the data, rather than bring the data to the query, and that's what HDFS does. And so it'll be beaten by an order of magnitude by by a system that doesn't virtualize I/O. And so I think I think that interface is just plain wrong. Now, you can certainly use it, and, and, and you give up a fair amount of performance in doing so. And I think this community should not be standardizing on file systems. That's 1970 technology. Okay. Well, Standardize I'll, on high-level high level interfaces. Okay, well, I'm, I'll, I'll drop, that was a, you know, that was a, that was a straw man. So, uh, <laughs> uh, what, what uh, um, is there any smaller architectural component than an entire DBMS, which is the, the model you seem to have, which is I need to build an entire DBMS. Is there any way that can be sliced down to a maybe a transaction manager or some of the components within that DBMS so that you, know, you don't have to build the entire DBMS and you can share work with, with, with these other teams? I mean, in the, in the database research community, there have been a whole bunch of projects to try and do this tinker toy approach, and they've all failed. So, I mean, it, the, the, there's been a fair amount of p people who wandered down that path, and it hasn't worked very well. I'm not sure, if Dirk, if you wanted to attack the straw man or <laughs> defend it. <laughs> no, I, I just want to, I mean, there we have Mike, so attacking is, <laughs> is covered already. Now, what I wanted to say is basically that one of the difficulties for the science people to align with themselves is that they are spread too much over time. I mean, for us, clearly, Already the first XLDB I came to, I was basically the only project which was running. I was, this was the old stuff basically, which was all going on already. But I mean, the difference is for us, things which would have been possible in 95 when clearly there wasn't a much choice, now are a completely different story because I think this big communities, they make moves with a latency which has to do with the size of the community. And you know, if you have to, all the, 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 the people who are in our community, they communicate via C++, via uh, whatever the infrastructure is they're all working in. And I think to make another move takes as long as the last one took. So, and, and I think we're in a completely different phase. We were the early adopter at the objectivity times, and now we are the Forbes 100, 1000 country, which is waiting to the last minute until the names of all the components on the Hadoop stack at least are stable, which they are not at the moment. Okay, I think we give Jacek the last word to try I, to get us back on time. I just want to mention that, um, we have lots of time. So, for example, LSST starts in 2022. However, we are asked by the funding agencies to have proof of concepts that those things will work, even now. So those tests that we run with, you know, 100 terabytes and 300 nodes and so on, they are not because we wanted to run them, but we, we really have to have something working, something that we can, we can budget and predict how much it will cost, so, so something real. And this is kind of where the, where the mismatch is, because we can't just tell them, oh, you know, things will work, don't worry, just wait five years, Mike Stonebreaker will build it for us. Uh, this will probably happen, but we just can't do it because we wouldn't pass any review. So we must have something real today, now. And we can't just use CIDB because, you know, you didn't pay much attention to, like, performance two years ago because it was not a good time for you. So eventually it will work the way we want it, hopefully. But again, the way funding agencies work and whatever we are required to do, it just, it really is decades. And it has to be very stable and, and very, 
it's just a different world. Okay. On that note, I'd like to thank the panel and uh, bring this session to an end. <laughs>